internet friends! Welcome to Tomabytes, a segment where instead of talking about an entire game or a broader aspect of the franchise, we zoom way, way in on just one element of game design and how that helps build the RPG adventure aspect of Pokemon games. Today we're taking a bite out of how Pokemon's multiplayer mode is balanced. Now I should preface this by saying I am not by any means a VGC or video game championship expert. I'm focused primarily on the single player RPG aspect of Pokemon games, but I am an idiot with way too many opinions. Recently my friend I'm a Blissey made several videos where they try to recreate world champion VGC players teams, and try to find out how long it would realistically take to do that legally without cheating. Now not to spoil those videos, they're very very entertaining and informative and I highly suggest you go watch them, but usually the answer to the is it realistic for a human being to get compared competitive viable Pokemon without cheating question throughout most of Pokemon's history has been no. From Gen 6 onward they made a lot of attempts to try and improve this, but that still leaves 17 years of Pokemon's history with very few attempts to make the grind to get competitive ready Pokemon remotely realistic. As Blissey demonstrated in their videos, it would sometimes take weeks worth of time to build one team in Gens 4 or 5. And this is even with some shortcuts like RNG manipulation. Now the point of today's video is not really to offer a solution to this problem, since for several games now, Game Freak has already made a considerable effort to make getting battle ready Pokemon more accessible for players nor am I pointing out anything that's really relevant to the metagame today. Rather, I'd like to take a look at the series from the ground up and why it kind of ended up the way that it did, what the goals originally were for multiplayer balancing and why it might have stayed that way for so long. I think to start with, Pokemon was never really balanced to be an eSport. That much should be obvious, eSports were not really a thing in 1996. As I explained in my red and blue video, the battle system in Gen 1 was originally designed from a standpoint of creating a lot of roles within a party, as well as some interesting boss encounters for the single player game, and multiplayer battling was added more or less as an afterthought. But when they did start to think about multiplayer battling, I think their goal was to balance it a lot more like items always on Super Smash Bros than League of Legends or whatever popular esport game people play. Basically, I'm trying to say Pokemon multiplayer is built a lot more like a party game than a game of chess, which makes kind of a poor environment for a tournament where adults play to win real money. In Generation 1 in particular, the genesis of the battling system, there are not a lot of moves to go around, and fewer Pokemon with a base stat distribution to actually make use of the ones they were given. Pokemon in general learn very few moves by level up. Instead, the rest of the movesets were filled out by a few good offensive TMs that only a few Pokemon could learn. The TMs that every Pokemon could learn all happened to be mostly disruptive moves that decrease the odds of the opponent being able to land an attack, or moves that set up progressive chip damage that you can then stall out. For example, every Pokemon in the game can learn Double Team, and every Pokemon in the game can learn Toxic via TM. Even Pokemon that would otherwise be powerhouses if they learned something mean and hard hitting like Aerodactyl, their main set of tools is still setting up some bullshit strategies based on luck and praying for some good coin flips. And I think that for the most part this was on purpose. First, I think it's because they genuinely did not have room on the cart to come up with more moves. Second, I think that they didn't want to impact the balance of the single player RPG by giving some Pokemon access to moves that would make them way, way more more powerful than anything else in the game. And by anything else in the game I mean the Pokemon that you would run into in single player mode. The best Pokemon in the game from a multiplayer battling standpoint are either legendary Pokemon like Mewtwo or Zapdos, Pokemon that are exclusively found in the Safari Zone like Tauros, Chansey, Exeggutor, and Rhydon, or Pokemon that you have to trade to evolve like Alakazam or Gengar. So the Pokemon that they did allow to be significantly more powerful and useful are all Pokemon that are fairly difficult to obtain and use in the main story, and wouldn't mess with the overall balance of the game that much. But the the third reason for this is I think they knew some people would be better at figuring out how to optimize than others, but they still wanted randos who met on the bus home from school or on their way to work to be more or less on equal ground if they linked up in battle. What would the point of linking up and battling be, after all, if there is a significant difference between most players' skill levels and team building? There are objectively good Pokemon in Gen 1 and objectively bad Pokemon in Gen 1. You could look at each person's team composition and determine the winner without even battling just based on base stats alone. But throw in a little double team, damage ranges, and gimmick fuckery and suddenly it's a lot less obvious who will win. And probably both players will end up having more fun because the outcome is less predictable. Both players may also end up pretty angry at each other, but what are you gonna do? Especially in a game where there's a wide range of ages all participating, you gotta give that seven-year-old some way to win against the big kids or the whole message of the game that age is not always an indicator of competence is thrown out the window. Obviously they did eventually hold some official competitions, 
But even then, the first ones were held before any guidebook was released explaining hidden mechanics like DBs and stat experience, evasion and RNG-based strategies were still allowed, and they had a cumulative level cap per team to allow for some variance in team building so that it would not be impossible to get some in-game Pokemon at the exact levels required for participation. It was basically Stadium Cup rules, because the Stadium Cup rule set was originally based on these competitions, and I think these were also designed more or less to keep skill from being the only factor in success. It still mattered, but in a weird way these competitions were built from the ground up specifically to make it so winning wasn't entirely up to being good at the game. So this is where it started. Pokemon was, for a long time, a series with just two main modes that it needed to balance. The first was a single player RPG with mechanics that worked to help tell a story, and balance the game so that out of hundreds of possible party members, each could still possibly have a meaningful role in your party and a somewhat unique role to play. The second was a multiplayer mode that was mostly played by people who knew each other in real life. That needed to be fun and accessible to players of a wide range of ages and skill levels. And the two modes needed to work mostly in harmony, so that party members that were way more powerful for the multiplayer mode were still difficult to obtain in the single player mode. And also this worked towards the design goal of having high value commodities with high demand and low supply. And this was to encourage trading, the other aspect of multiplayer. But this got harder and harder to balance as the series grew. In Gen 3, Eevees and Ivies were introduced to help the ballooning number of Pokemon in the single player RPG all specialize more and maintain some kind of unique role to play in the party. These stats always existed in some form or another, representing a Pokemon's genetics and learned experience through battle, so that even Pokemon of the same species and level would not have identical stats and would have variety among them just like real creatures. But they were rebalanced in Gen 3, and with the addition of natures and abilities, there were now a lot of uncontrollable variables in play that determined a Pokemon's performance in battle. It didn't all work right away, and it definitely negatively impacted the multiplayer mode. I think it's possible originally Game Freak didn't intend to have these stats play a significant role in any scenario, because when Ruby and Sapphire were released, in-game there was really no way to know what a Pokemon's EVs were. There was no mention in that game of EVs, IVs, or even which natures raised or lowered which stats. But this eventually changed in Emerald, which introduced EV reducing berries, a rudimentary IV checker at the frontier, and challenges that might require you to understand how to optimize like the Battle Frontier facilities. This was back in the era where the games were still mostly designed for a Japanese audience, so there was a first party Japanese guidebook that also explained EV training that we never got. But anyway, there were already cracks starting to show in both the balance of the single player and multiplayer modes, as with very few to no ways to control any of these variables in most of Gen 3, a single player mode requiring you to optimize tacked on to the end of Gen 3, which had absolutely no tools to enable you to do that made it really hard to suddenly catch up to the point where you'd actually be able to participate in these modes. Unless, of course, you were Japanese. But additionally, this created a much larger skill gap between players who could somehow learn about these systems and how to manipulate them, and players who couldn't, making it much less likely that if you met up to battle someone, you'd be on an even playing field. But even for those who could figure it out, with just the tools that were available in-game, and no external things like RNG manipulation or stat calculators, they would still likely not be able to obtain completely flawless 6 IV Pokemon. It was much more likely that the best result people could get was one or two high IVs, and EVs distributed into mostly one or two stats for some kind of loose optimization. And that, in theory, meant that the difference between people who did understand these systems and people who didn't still wouldn't be too great to overcome by just sheer luck or perseverance. But these problems came to the forefront with Diamond and Pearl and the introduction of Wi-Fi battling, and along with it, the introduction of the official Video Game World Championship. With the single player and multiplayer modes already kind of struggling to balance out with the new mechanics in the series, suddenly there was now a third mode the Game Freak needed to balance the game for. Not just single player, not just casual multiplayer, but also the official worldwide tournament where adults competed for real money. I think that Game Freak assumed, or maybe just hoped, that if they made something prohibitively difficult to do, most people would just not do it. Like trying to get legitimate 5 IV Pokemon in Gens 4 and 5. I think they just assumed that most people would probably stop at 3 IV guys, and that the world level competitions would still be played out with mostly imperfect Pokemon, and that all those pathways to success in the old games would still be viable in these. Coin flips and all, just like it worked in Gen 3. And really they're right, people mostly didn't do it, but I think they underestimated the ability of the community to find and implement workarounds to actually doing it legitimately. When you buy secondhand Gen 3 and 4 cards, if they still have data on them, 
almost always there's stuff to the brim with hacked Pokemon. Whether it was completely illegal means like PK Hex Pokegen or Action Replay, or hell, even legal means like RNG manipulation, if you make the correct way to do something too expensive, time consuming, or tedious, players will find their own workarounds to the problem. If it is possible within the code of the game to get legal 31 IVs in every stat, people will find a way to do that whether that way itself is legal or not. So instead of the competitions playing out more like their more casual, balanced multiplayer mode was intended to, instead people were competing with nearly impossible to get perfect Pokemon anyway. This is a generalization by the way, I'm not talking about anyone in particular, don't freak out. I'm sure some people did get theirs legitimately, it's not actually impossible, but a lot of people did. And you can't really go back from there once all of your competitors are using 6 IV Pokemon and expect someone to take a chance on some lower IVs when nobody else is, and there's a cash prize at stake. So they had to sort of backwards integrate more accessible, competitive, viable Pokemon into their single player game while still not bending on keeping good Pokemon hard to get or wanting the broader, less serious multiplayer game to remain fun for even low skill players. And that is a hard thing to balance. If good Pokemon are too easy to get in the games themselves, that will break the balance of the main mode of the game, the single player RPG. Those pieces of data that are so difficult to optimize are unfortunately really important to the single player RPG experience. Experience, and making Pokemon feel like real creatures and not just sets of numbers. And they still don't want to explicitly encourage 100% optimization or everyone will start doing it. And the main player base of Pokemon, young children, won't be able to win with coin flips anymore if they get on random Wi-Fi battles or just try to take on an older sibling. If good Pokemon are too hard to get, people will just give up and hack them in. And it will look really bad when the top players in the world are all playing with Pokemon that average players just simply can't even dream of getting. As was the case for a good chunk of Pokemon's eSport history. And finally, if the game is too reliant on RNG mechanics for multiplayer balance, then it doesn't work super well as an eSport where people expect to be rewarded for playing well with skill rather than luck. In my mind, I don't know if there's really a perfect solution to this problem. Because in order to make competitive Pokemon more accessible, they actually have already had to cut RPG aspects out of the series already. The main reason that Eevees, Ivies, Natures, and all of those things exist in the first place is to make Pokemon feel unique, like a real creature. Each Pokemon is born with some set of stats that might make them more suited to a certain moveset if that species has access to enough moves, or has a base stat total that allows multiple playstyles. It's supposed to be another one of those elements that gives a Pokemon kind of a will of its own, an identity of its own beyond just what the player wants for it. There's that balance of player agency versus nature again. But now, technically, all of that is changeable between bottle caps, mints, ability capsules, and so on. Now, inevitably, there is a correct version of each species of Pokemon and variations are wrong instead of just unique. Even if the options for changing around these variables are limited, the fact that it is now possible for any Pokemon to eventually become perfect does sort of make these numbers and variables serve a different purpose than they originally did. But that's just one example. Pokemon has to try to be a lot of things at once, and it doesn't always get the balance just right. It still is a single player RPG with stats that have to inform a role playing experience and party building with hundreds of characters. It's also a multiplayer game that needs to be enjoyable to people of all ages and skill levels. And it's also a professional chess game that people play for money that increasingly more and more people are interested in. If they move the needle too far in any direction, the series will inevitably lose one of those things, because none can encroach too much on the others. If there aren't enough back-end tedious systems informing the roleplay, the single player suffers. If you make the main game shorter so that it's not as hard to get stuff for the multiplayer part of the game, you're diminishing a core aspect of the franchise. But if single player is too tedious and involves too much of an investment of time, the eSport suffers and excludes people who don't have the time to put into it. But if you put too much emphasis on this high-level play and there aren't enough bullshit coin flips for kids to win, then the casual multiplayer aspect of the game suffers. In order for Pokemon to remain all of these things, the series will always have to be just a little bit unfair to each of these groups of players. The question is, just how unfair should it be? So to summarize, oh my shoulder just cracked. I think Game Freak envisioned originally some version of VGC where the top players in the world would be playing with like 
three IV Pokemon Max, and it was still kind of a free-for-all who would win. That obviously didn't happen, so they needed to adapt and still kind of are. There are also some obvious solutions to this accessibility problem, like an official version of something like Pokemon Showdown, for example. But we have to keep in mind that there is a secret fourth thing, which is the business model that Pokemon games are made for, which requires the purchase of multiple games so that you can get everything. But I've already ranted about that enough in the Dexit video recently, so I'll spare you the encore presentation. Are there any mechanics you want to see unpacked in a future Tomabytes? Let me know, you know how to reach me. And of course, if you want to see any of my in-depth reviews of Pokemon games, click on that playlist in the pinned comment. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon for more Pokemon videos. See ya!